Yes, absolutely. I've been observing Penny Rabbit's prophecy of the Bachelor. Yes. And it started since October 15th. So if you guys have not seen it, I beg of you to watch it. But I just want to say, I'm just so excited because I finally understand the sanctuary cleansing and the 2300 days. Amen. I, I jumped up for joy because I finally got it after being the seventh day of all my life. But it just kept, something just clicked. With the you and then his, it was just amazing. So I just want to oh, praise the Lord. What is his? What is his thing called again? Panoramic pro uh, prophecy. Yeah. And it's so on go to amazingfacts.org amazing and you yes. can watch it. Right. I've been watching it on at, on Facebook or YouTube, and it has okay. been so enlightening. Oh, three ABN. Three ABN as well. That's awesome. He just got through with his revelation now thing, and he's hopped right into this panoramic prophecy. Awesome. Okay. Um, last time we we we've been looking at Daniel chapter nine, and specifically we're talking about this prophecy in Daniel chapter nine. It starts in verse twenty four and goes to verse twenty seven. And this particular prophecy is a life changing prophecy. I like to say all atheists come because this is so amazing, isn't it? Isn't it amazing, this prophecy? And we've gone through verses 24 and 25 in detail. We're going through verse 26 right now, and we've got this idea of, could, could, could you read this for us, Bill? And you okay? Read verse 26. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolation is then decreed. What is anointed one? What do we say? What Messiah. word? Is Messiah. What's another word we say? Christ. Christ, right? So I'll, when this is anointed one, we're talking about Jesus, aren't we? Okay. And it says he'll be cut off. And what do we say this cut off means? He's experiencing second death. This is the death that the wicked will experience at the end of time. And so there was a few questions after uh, the presentation last time about the second death. Uh, if you notice what it says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, perish, but have everlasting life. So we know the second death means perish and this is the death that the bible says that the messiah is going to experience not just the first death right when you accept christ as your lord and savior uh if you're alive and you last long enough and your body expires you experience the first death right <coughs> Uh, his death on the cross doesn't necessarily save us from the first death, but it does save us from the second death. And that's the death. He, why? Because he's, that's the one he experienced. He was cut off. He experienced the second death, the death of the wicked are going to experience here at the end of time. And this type of death is, there's no coming back from it, right? The only person that can come back from it and didn't come back from it is the only person that never sinned, Right. The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we, but without sin, right? He never shut up, but not for himself. I love that. Thank you for bringing that up, Steve. Isn't that what the verse says? Isn't that what it says? He's cut off, but not for himself. He suffered the second death, not because he deserved it, but because we needed it, right? Without him suffering the second death, we can't have eternal life. And so that's what he did for us. He was cut off. He suffered the second death in our place. And this second death experience, you know, you have this false teaching that God burns people forever in a place called hell, right? And we covered that a little bit last time, too. And I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any other questions or issues about this. because I did have some comments after the class. You know, when you look at the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31, is one of my favorite places to go. And I think Gina is going to get there before anybody else. And, and notice what it says in Jeremiah 7, verse 31. Now, I'll give you some context here. Believe it or not, God's people, they had been deceived by Satan and were 
doing a horrible thing. They were burning their children in the a fire alive to a false god called Moloch. I don't even like saying his name. And so notice how God responds. He's pleading with his people not to do this horrible thing. This is in Jeremiah chapter 7. Yeah, and verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. Valley of Hinnom. Yeah, Valley of Hinnom. And Jesus refers to this too. Gehenna is the Greek word. But since we're in the Old Testament, this is the Hebrew. So notice what it says there. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Notice it's not even part of God's character to burn somebody alive. It's not even part of his character. It's the devil who comes up with this idea. So this idea that unless you can turn to Jesus, unless you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's going to burn you forever. I mean, that's not a good motivation, is it? Right? Scott? Uh, how do we, how do we um, um, look at that, that teaching and then combine that with like what it says in the third message about those who receive the, the mark of the beast? Yeah, you know, it's really bad. Uh, you know, I, I love reading the first angel's message, right? And and the second angel's message is, you know, it, it opens people's eyes up to truth that you have a fallen system, right? But the third angel's message, I like to all call upon somebody else to read. Because <laughs> it's so bad. You know, and it says in there, it talks about uh, the people suffering a fire, you know, but it's referring to them not being ready for the second coming. So, because it's in the presence of Christ and the angels, you see. It says here, this is Revelation chapter 14. It starts in verse 9. Third angel follows and saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image, the beast is the papacy, the image is apostate Protestantism, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also bring to the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. That's a horrible thing. And it says uh, that, that, that he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Well, that presence takes place at the second coming. God doesn't want anybody to be tormented. He doesn't want anybody to be destroyed. But the problem is most people choose that. So at the second coming of Christ, he's going to come into this atmosphere with all his glory, right? We can't look at the sun 93 million miles away, but the creator of the sun is going to be right here in our atmosphere. What do the wicked people do at the second coming in order to avoid this type of punishment? They do hide. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 6, doesn't it? It says this specifically. Uh, the sky receded as a scroll, talking about at the second coming when Jesus is in our atmosphere again, with all his glory, it's rolled up and every mountain and island moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said that the rocks and the mount and the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's God the Father, God the Son. So I think the third angel's message is referring to the second coming. So the term the wrath of God, does that only apply to the second coming or what happens to the second coming? Or? I think you have to look at the context. Yeah. I, th I don't think every single place where it says wrath of God is referring to the second coming, but I think a lot of them are. Brother? I think it's when the Lord is. Uh, is that what it says for the Lord to rise up and say, A result is yeah, like a I agree. It's a it's it's a, it's a consequence, isn't it? 
of our own choice. That's exactly right. But God about God being addictive or <laughs> Right. I agree. Pastor, so God's yes? wrath was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And three different times in Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28. All three times it said, Why have you given me up? This is God's wrath, this is turning away from us. That will be destroyed. That God. separation, yeah. right, is what he experienced on the cross, and that <coughs> is the second death experience. That is. Yeah, exactly. Um, notice what he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 about God's character. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some call, count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should what perish. perish, not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to be destroyed by the second death, right? Why? Because he suffered the second death in our place. Nobody has to go through it, but the problem is most people choose sin over the Savior, and sin destroys us. Right? Have you ever put something in your body that you knew was not healthy for you, but you desired? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> Is that a heresy? <laughs> you know, I was thinking cigarettes or you know, alcohol or. <laughs> Some some drugs, you know. But but the thing about it is we when we indulge in sin, we are committing suicide slowly, right? And ultimately, at the end of all this mess that we're living in, right? The people who want to be saved and have eternal life, who give themselves to Jesus, they're gonna be saved and have eternal life. The people who want to hold on to sin and destroy themselves, they're gonna perish. Right? Everybody gets what they want in the end. The wicked, they're going to perish and not exist anymore. And the righteous, they're going to have eternal life and live forever with God. They get what they choose. They get, yeah, they get what they choose. What did you say, Glenn? My will be done. Yes, that's exactly right. And, you know, I, I say to people, you know, oh, yeah, I want to go to heaven. Well, you know, and they're not attending church or not reading their Bibles or not spending time with God. Why do you want to go to heaven and be in the presence of God? All the time when you don't want to go to church once a week and to be in the presence of God or spend time with Him in the world, you know, you have to have your heart converted, you have to be born again, right? Naturally, we don't desire God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, that we're our hearts, our characters, we are at war with God, enmity, yeah. And we have to be born again, Jesus said in John chapter 3. And so, when I look at a God who's willing to suffer what I deserve. So that I can only have what he deserves. I say, wow, that, that's life changing. That kind of love is what changes me. And I love what it says. I'm using the word love because I want to emphasize it. I love what it says in 1 John chapter 4. Notice what it says there in verse 16. Who's got that? 1 John. Chapter four, he starts it. He starts this concept in verse eight. And, and notice what he says there in verse 16. And then we're going to jump to verse 18. Okay, so you got verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Okay, isn't that beautiful? But that's not the best news. Notice what it says in verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You see, it's not either turn or burn doesn't convert a person, right? It's the love of God that converts a person. And when we see what God is willing to go through for us so that we can have eternal life, that's what's converting, right? And notice how perfect love, the love of God, cast out fear. Because fear involves torment, right? You know, Martin Luther, he struggled with, he struggled with fear. He, was, he, he, he would take and beat himself even, right? What's that word called? I hate the word. Yes, thank you. And he would do that and mutilate himself because he was like trying to beat himself into submission. 
because he knew he was a sinner and didn't know how to didn't know what to do about the sin. He felt condemned, brother. I guess I was just thinking about you mentioned fear and love as uh, maybe the simplest way to distill whether something is coming from God's will and desire or from Satan's perspective. Because if you're being pressured or forced, a very strong indication that it's not at all from God is he doesn't coerce us into loving him. So even the concept of a hellfire torment um, I don't think that the intention of it all is to scare us it's just that for us to understand the reality but not in a fearful way but, you know Satan is the one that brings that concept of eternal torture present to that's right I guess I just see if if I feel afraid of the time like if someone is forcing me or pressuring me into their will I don't feel like they're allowing me to choose freely. That's true. That's true. And I see that. In the I love how God gives us a choice. You know, I mean, He's the creator of the universe. He can command. I mean, we ought to obey immediately just because who He is, right? But He gives us a choice. You ever see the uh, the series The Chosen, right? Uh, and and I, one of the episodes in that. Mary Magdalene has been delivered from demons, right? And she's wanted to keep the Sabbath for the first time in a long time. So she invites some friends over, you know, and it's a Friday night and the sun's gone down and they're sitting around the table, you know, and uh, her friends are there and this, she hasn't done this in a while. She's a little nervous about it, right? And then she hears a knock at the door and she goes to the door and opens the door and it's Jesus, you know, who, who had delivered her from these demons, right? And, and I got, I, I was thinking to myself, he knocked on the door. Why didn't he just open the door and walk in? You know, he deserved to do that. But that's how God's character is. He gives us this choice. I think it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus dying on the cross for our sins gives us a choice. Because now we don't have to be in bondage to sin. We can have salvation through Christ. And that's the beautiful message. I love this. And that's why Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27 is about. But our popular culture and the churches today has turned this around, and they say it's talking about the Antichrist. Isn't that amazing? You take something so beautiful, you talk about Jesus, and they now are saying it's talking about the Antichrist. We're going to get into that a little more in just a minute. Uh, any questions about this? God doesn't burn people forever and ever. And if you have that belief, you don't understand what Jesus did on the cross. If you think that the wicked are burning forever and ever in a place called hell, then you don't understand what Jesus died on the cross. And what you do is at Easter time, you focus on the physical pain and not focus on the real pain, right? That he went through, the second death experience. He said he would have died in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, he would have died had the angel not came and strengthened the ministry. Yeah, he did. There's sweat and drops of blood. That yeah. we're told. Scott? It's interesting that um, Isaiah and Isaiah 33 asked the question, um, who, who can dwell in a devouring fire and everlasting burnings? And the, the answer is those who walk uprightly and are righteous. So it's almost like the presence of God is a devouring fire but only with, with sinners that's correct yeah that's a very good point a good example of that is when moses went up on the mountain and came down with his right it's just from talking with his body yeah he was uh reflecting the glory of god and they couldn't even look at his face yeah. could they? they had to put a veil over his face matter of fact listen to what it says there in romans chapter 12 kind of going along with what scott said uh the last verse in romans chapter 12 says this for our God is a consuming fire, right? I, what did I say? I meant Hebrews. I don't know why I said Romans. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27. So notice the Bible says God's a consuming fire because if you're going to hold on to sin, then the sin's got to be consumed. We'll be consumed along with it. That's the bottom line. Isn't it? It's a consequence. Judy? I've had people tell me all the time, they say, well, how can you believe 
what I believe, they said, when it says that the smoke will rise up forever and ever and ever and ever. And I said, yeah, just like a balloon, it rises up till it pops. It's not gone. Yeah, you know, exactly. I said that anything yeah. else that dissipates, if there, where's it going to go? Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and then I'll be like, well, no, it goes to heaven. And I said, I can't, I couldn't even get into it because they, their, their thoughts are so dispersed. You know, they're, they're worse than the smoke <laughs> because yeah. they're, they're, they're not, they don't have a, a focus. The problem is the Bible says in Revelation chapter 17, that the world has been made drunk with these false theories right these myths right. right about god and so when you go to talk to somebody and show them the truth it's like you know first of all what do you mean uh i'm wrong my church is wrong there's no way you know you got you gotta get through that barrier and then for them to be able to understand really what the bible says there it, it totally goes against god's character to believe that he would burn somebody forever and so some of the verses that they bring up how about this in uh, Matthew chapter 25? Uh, this is verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So here's two different ways to interpret this, right? Tim, we could say that the fire is lasting forever or the results of the fire is lasting forever. There's two different ways to interpret this. Which way is the right way? That's what we got to ask ourselves, right? Because it does say everlasting fire there. Notice verse 46. Can somebody read that, please? And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So those are the two choices. Everlasting punishment, not everlasting punishing, right? It's not an ongoing process. Uh, if it was everlasting punishing, he would have used a Greek word, a Greek verb as present active indicative, which means an ongoing process. He doesn't do that. It's punishment. There's an end to it. And how do we know for sure? Yeah, yeah. A little worse than that, though, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but it's still an end. There is it an ends. End. It ends, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about forever here in just a second. Notice 2 Thessalonians 1 9. And I would write this in, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, next to everlasting punishment there, put in 2 Thessalonians 1 9, allowing the Bible to interpret itself. What's it say there in 2 Thessalonians 1 9? will be totally destroyed by the presence of God and the glorious majesty of his power. Yeah, what version are you reading? Okay. So, so it will be punished with everlasting destruction. Yeah. Shut up in the presence of the Lord and the majesty of his power. Not everlasting life in a fiery place, but everlasting destruction, right? Awesome. Right? What's it say in the New King James? Same. Okay, what's it say in the King James? Destruction. Destruction. Notice it's using the word destruction. So the punishment is destruction. Do you see that? It's not continuing on and living in a burning place. So some people, they want to bring up uh, this idea forever. Sometimes forever doesn't always mean forever, does it? Uh, do we have some examples of that? Well, one of my, one of my favorite examples is Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Notice what she says there. Yeah, you know, Hannah, this is a this is a moment of God. So if you look at the look at the, the son that she raised up, Samuel, you know, which is the book's named after him, right? Uh, one of the greatest prophets of God in the Old Testament. And so when we look at this, she goes to uh, the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the temple's not built yet, right? She goes to the tabernacle and she's pouring out her heart to God because she doesn't have a child and she's depressed about it. And so I'm starting in verse 12 of 1 Samuel. And it happened that she continued praying there before the Lord that Eli washed her mouth. So Eli is uh, uh, the high priest at the time. And so he's watching her. And what is she doing? She's praying like this. You know, so he, he doesn't, he doesn't hear anything. He just sees her mouth moving, right? And so uh, now verse 13, Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. 
you know. So you've been drinking a little alcohol, and now you're here at the tabernacle. These two, do, they don't really go together. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Well, gonna, what, you know, put your wine away from you. Right? But that's not what she was doing. Was she? Her answer is said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrow, sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink and have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. It's interesting how she considered drinking an alcoholic beverage as wickedness. You see that? For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now that Eli answered and said, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And so she has a baby, right? God, he, he answers her prayer and she has a baby. And, and she's so grateful that this is what she said. So now it's a, it's a year later and it was time to go back to the tabernacle and, you know, have this a uh, special yearly sacrifice that her family would do, that her husband would do. But in verse 22, Hannah says, did not go up with him at that time. For she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there for how long? Forever. Forever. And then in verse 28, she does do this. Uh, after a period of time, she brings the child to Eli and gives the child to Eli to live with him and to help him with the tabernacle services. And notice verse 28, therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. So forever in this context means as long as he lives. And that's the point. Um, you know, I borrowed some money from Mark Rush. I can't pay it back. Uh, the Bible had a way for God's people to be able to handle something like that. I go work for Mark for as much as seven years. And, but, uh, you know, but he had another uh, a woman slave that was there uh, that was also working off of debt. And, you know, and then I fell in love with her and married her. And now we have children and seven years are up. I can go free, but guess what? She can't. And so I go to Mark and said, Mark, you know, well, I, I like being uh, your servant. I'm going to, I'm going to be your servant for the rest of my life. So you know what he does? He takes me uh, in front of a public ceremony and pierces my ear. You know? oh. Yeah, do you know that? Oh. They, they would put it up against a piece of wood there and put a wood all in there, pierce the ear. And it was a symbol that I would belong to Mark forever. It says forever in the Bible, but how long did I belong to it? As long as I live, right? So you gotta look at the context where the Bible says forever. It didn't always exactly mean forever. Jonah, he gets swallowed up by a huge fish, and he says, I was in there forever. You ever been, I was standing in line forever, you know, I was trying to get my license, you know, you know renewed, standing in line forever. We say the same thing, don't we? Don't we do that? <laughs> and so I think we, we, we got to be careful about how forever is used in the Bible. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, when we look at that. Yeah, so we have, uh, I think, Second Peter. We talks about uh, this in Second Peter chapter two. It says uh, it's in verse six. It, it just goes to show that eventually sin is going to be taken care of. That's what he starts saying there in verse four. If God did not spare the angels who sin, these are the Angels who were in heaven, they rebelled against God. This is the one-third of the angels talked about in Revelation chapter 12. They were cast out of heaven. And the Bible goes on to talk about the time of Noah. And, uh, and then he starts talking about the cities of Solomon and Gomorrah. They were turned into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. They're an example of what's going to happen at the end of time. So notice it says they're turned to ashes. What, what does it say there in Jude 7? Solomon and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But you saw in 2 Peter chapter 2, that turned to ashes. So it doesn't mean that the fire is going on for eternity. It means the result of the fire is for eternity. You see the difference? Okay. All right, sister? So it, just, it has eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. Thank you. That's a great way to sum it up. All right. I want to go forward now in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. 
Oh, Unless there's any questions about this, anybody have any other questions? I kind of covered some of the ones that some people bring up. So it says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. To the end of the war, desolation is determined. This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So we have two parts to this verse, don't we? The first part of the verse is talking about the Messiah. The second part of the verse is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Why is he talking about Jerusalem here? Because that's what Daniel prayed for in his prayer in Daniel chapter 9. He prayed about his people. He prayed about the city of Jerusalem. He prayed about the temple. And so the angel Gabriel's come to give him an understanding of the vision. That is his primary concern. And the vision means the one, the 2300-day prophecy given in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. That's the vision. There's no vision given in Daniel chapter 9. How many years between Daniel 8 and 9? 12. 12 years. So he gets a vision in Daniel 8, but didn't fully understand the time prophecy. In Daniel 9, he's praying and seeking God, and then the angel Gabriel comes and gives him understanding of what he didn't understand in Daniel chapter 8. But at the same time, he's answering his prayer, given in Daniel chapter 9, and he gives information about the city of Jerusalem. So you gotta, you got to break these apart. You know, this is talking about this, and this is talking about that. Don't put them together and say they're talking about the same thing, you know. And so... It goes on to say, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. That's talking about the Messiah. The rest of the verse is talking about Jerusalem again. So, what does it mean he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week? Well, notice what it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. <coughs> Somebody have 26 verse 28? This pure juice represents my blood, and the bread represents my body that I will give for the sins of the world. Okay. Notice, if she's reading from a paraphrase, notice from a translation, what does it say? So this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the mission of sins. All right. So it says New Testament. What is the word for te testament? Covenant. What? Covenant. So somebody has to die. <laughs> so in the New King James, this is the way they translated it. But this is my blood of the new covenant. This is the covenant that he's confirming in the middle of the week. Right? So let's let's draw this out. We saw from Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, that this prophecy starts in 457 BC. Right? Seventh year of Artaxerxes is when the command to restore but rebuild Jerusalem. Given in Ezra chapter 7, verse 7. So and we go forward 457 BC, and it says six, it says seven plus sixty-two. So 69 weeks, right? And then we multiply it times seven days in a week per week. We're going to put a multiply there. And then we get 483 years. Why do I say years? Year. We're using the day for your principle found in where? Ezekiel and Numbers. Yes, brother. <laughs> okay, they use it a little differently, though. They, uh, they're confused about the starting point. But let's go forward. 483 years. And when we go from 457 B.C. plus 483 years, what year do we come to? 27 A.D., right? Okay, and the Bible tells us that the Messiah is going to appear in 27 AD. Well, that, that happened, right? What year was Jesus baptized? 27. Yeah, and how do we know that? Luke chapter 3 tells us that he was baptized, right? So I'm going to say Jesus was anointed or baptized in 27 AD. Just like Daniel predicted. 
The Messiah is going to appear 483 years after the giving of the command to rebuild Jerusalem, right? And 483 years later, is, that's 27 AD. So now the Bible focuses on this last week, week of years, right? It goes to 34 AD, and it says in the middle of this week, right in 31 AD, right? This is where the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. You see, in the middle of this week, that's when the Messiah was supposed to die for our sins, brother. Do you think that it was this prophecy that would have caused the wise men to be present at Jesus' birth, or was there something that would have pointed more specifically? Because 27 years is a big window. Uh, just to, you know, what, what was it that made them travel that way? And why, I guess, what was, why were they expecting the Messiah? Was it this or was there another prophecy? Very good question. You know, the wise men had the writings of Daniel, right? Who else did they have the writings of? Balaam. Balaam. They had, Balaam. yeah, they had the writings of Balaam, didn't they? So when they looked at computing, uh, the Messiah is supposed to be soon, right? And then they look at the writings of Balaam, in, and we have what he states there in Numbers, right? That uh, you're going to see a star in the sky. And so when they put the two together and said, hey, that's the Messiah, that's the king, we're going to go worship him. It wasn't just any king. They understood this was uh, some a divine intervention, right? Because the Bible says they came and worshiped him and gave him the most costly gifts that they could give, right? Gold, frankincense, murder. Okay. What do you think wrote down those things that Balaam said? Do you think he wrote it down or the, it was in the history of that, uh, the Moabites? Mo yeah, because obviously there were other people besides just Balak with Balaam, right? Yeah. And so they probably heard what he said and passed it on, or God gave the vision to Moses, and Moses wrote it down in numbers that way. You know, I don't know for sure, but, uh, you know, it was written down. Just in case somebody didn't know the story we're talking about, the children of Israel have left Egypt in the Old Testament there, and they're on the way to the promised land, and they're going through uh, the kingdom of, of Balak's kingdom, right? And Balak is like, what am I going to do? There's over a million people here, and I don't have the resources to, to defend them. They're going to consume all my resources coming through my land like this. I want them out of here. And so uh, somebody suggested, well, why don't you get Balaam to come and curse them? And so he sent people to get Balaam. Balaam was a prophet of God at the time. And Balaam said, no, I can't go. And then so then he sends his princes and says, you know, I'll give you a little more money. Here's my princes. You know, I want, I want you to come and curse the people. And so Balaam had a problem, didn't he? Right, like the the Italian conductor that I couldn't communicate with. I need to get on a train one time in Italy. He did this, right? And I did this, <laughs> and he did this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, uh, he 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 was a little bit uh, consumed with wanting material things. So he gets on his donkey and he heads over. You know, uh, to go west to meet up with Balak and curse the children of God. And, you know, it's a pretty fascinating story. But by the time he gets there, he says to Balak, all I can do is when I open my mouth, I'm just going to say what God tells me to say. And when he opens his mouth each time, he does it three times. He just blesses the children of God, right? And uh, Balak, of course, gets all upset. And uh, it is one of those times is when he says, he talks about the scepter. Well, yeah. And, and when this king appears, there's going to be a star in the sky. That's my paraphrase. And so he says that is one of these times he's blessing the children of Israel. So we have, you know, the, the, uh, the wise man in the east had the writings of Balaam. He had the writings of Daniel. They had the writings of some other people in the Old Testament too, right? And so they were able to put two and two together and say, oh, that's it. That's the star. Of course, we know the star was a group of angels, right? Right. And so I think it's pretty cool how he did that. So I do think they had some understanding of this was happening. That's exactly what I think, yeah, right. So here we go. 
uh, the prophecy says from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah appears, 483 years. It happened right on time. How do we know it happened on time? What did Jesus say in Mark chapter 1? The time is. In verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. That's what Jesus said. Mm. What time was he talking about? This time prophecy. After he was baptized, the time is fulfilled. I'm here, you know. David talked about it. I'm here. Of course, they were like, mm, you know. <laughs> they still are. You know, yeah, we have to be careful. We don't do the same thing, right? That's yeah. so why you got to read the Bible and accept what it says. So. Well, that's what I said when I walked in here. I'm here. Yes, that's right. We're glad you're here too, Sandy. Amen. And so it says, now notice what it said here in the text. And I'm back to Daniel chapter 9 now. Now we, we've covered some of this already in detail, so I am summarizing some of the things that we've already covered. So if you've got questions about it, please let me know. This is a great time. Ask any questions that you may have, and, um, and we'll do the best we can to answer them from the Bible. So notice um, here we are in Daniel chapter 9, and he says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offerings. So notice, he's, he says he's confirming that right before he goes to the cross, he says he's confirming the covenant, right? So this is three and a half years from his public ministry, which started in 27 AD. Three and a half years later, he then suffers on the cross for our sins. Just on time. Isn't it beautiful how the Bible predicted the year that the Messiah would appear and the year he died on the cross? Isn't it amazing, right? I love this. And so he does that. And then we have this. Remember, it's in the middle of this last week of years, right? But then the rest of this is an opportunity for the Jews, the Jews right? His native people there to accept him as the Messiah because he does ascend to heaven. Uh, and then the disciples start sharing the message about Jesus with the Jews. And then they ultimately reject him. And in 34 AD, Stephen is stoned. And that kind of seals the deal. Uh, you're not God's chosen people anymore. Right? The Jews, the literal descendants of Abraham, are not God's chosen people anymore. Because they rejected the Messiah. As a people. As a people, right. Was, was that mentioned in Acts? Multiple. Yeah, yeah. Acts chapter seven. Is there a time reference in that? I can't remember. It says it was thirty-four AD. Brother, since Christ was crucified on Passover day, which is the spring, twenty-seven AD and thirty-four AD, the fall. That's important because then you add eighteen ten. Yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, I don't know of a reference of the time period there. Uh, the event tells us that they have shut them off. They fulfilled. Uh, remember in Daniel chapter 7, it says 70 weeks are determined for your people, right? So the 70 weeks, I got 70 weeks, times seven days in a week, that's 490 years. I apply the year, day for year principle, right? So 490 years. So at this point, I'm at 483, so I have to go all the way to 34 AD to get the 490. But I don't know of anything in the book of Acts specifically, Sean, that's, that tells us it's the 34 AD. I just know from the prophecy that it's got to end in 34 AD because there's 490 years. How do we know it happened in 34 AD? Well, that's what I'm saying to Sean. I don't know anything that can specifically give us or nail it down. Somebody have their hand up, brother? Well, I just thought Did, that maybe uh, you know that that signified the end of the probationary period for the Jewish people. And right. The was to, to go to the Gentiles. So, I mean, I'm not sure if historically you could tie like the spread of the gospel outside of Jerusalem to that morning, right? You know, yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it tied specifically to 34 AD. I just know it has to be 34 because of the 490 years. You can get there by association with cross referencing and digital history. I don't know of a place. Scott, do you know a place where you can actually nail down where it says it's the so 
so many years of the of the Roman Caesar or so many years of this person that was governor of this area. You know, Luke does that, Luke chapter 3. He gives us details about when this is, right? And it says, it, it says the middle of the week. So, you know, the week has to end seven years later. So, I mean, Luke 3 does give us timing information. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. And we know that's 27 AD. Because we can go to Josephus and nail that down. Because it says it's the 15th year of Tiberius, right? Pastor, that 34 we, AD, the <clears throat> disciples went, everybody, they left Jerusalem right then and went to the Gentiles at that point in time. Well, you know, a lot Except of, some of the disciples did stay that's, there. that's right. They stayed in Jerusalem because Paul met with them in Jerusalem. But, but I want you to see in 34 AD, that's when this probational period of time that God had given the Jews ended. It has to be 34 AD. It has to be 34 AD. So I think we can approach it two different ways. One, using the, the timing reference in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, knowing that there, he's in the middle of the league, so it has to be seven years. And the other, using that the overall time period is 490. So I think that's the way we can kind of nail down 34. How many was Stephen was stoned in 34 AD, Josephus? No, no. That, that's what I'm saying. We don't have, you know, Luke 3 tells us the timing of when he's baptized. We can nail that down because it says it's the 15th year of Tiberius, right? We can nail that down pretty quickly. So, and, and Josephus tells us that he started really in 12 AD. So I add 12 plus 15, I can get 27. It, it, the historical evidence matches exactly what the prophecy said would happen. Okay. So I, I can nail that down. This one I can nail down really pretty easily. And the, the, the prophecy says that you have one more week of years to go. But I can't say from Acts chapter 7, where it's talking about the stoning of Stephen, that there's something there that tells me it's 34 AD. I just know it from, it's the end of the prophecy. You know, it, it mentions two different things. It's overall 490, and there's seven more years after Luke chapter 3. How about the 31 AD? Is there anything exact on that day? Well, it says in the middle of this week. That's the, only That's the only thing, right? So it's not all. I mean, if you look at other churches, they'll they'll give you a range. They'll say thirty. It could be thirty-two. I mean, you know, they give a range in there, but they don't always nail down thirty-one A.D. But, but you know, the Adventists taking what we've learned from uh, archaeology, and we can nail down. The date that the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Once we can nail this down, the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> Jesus baptism. Exactly. And that's the beautiful thing about it, you know. And it wasn't until I came to the Adventist Church that I saw this. It's, it's really amazing how accurate this prophecy is. So, what I want to look at is 34 AD, that ended the probational period of time for the Jews. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 21. You know how people say the Jews are God's chosen people. So, here's the deception. The devil knows that this is the truth, and he tries to get people away from this, Okay. So I'm going to talk about the deception here that is the popular teaching now among all these churches. It's amazing to me how they've all bought into this, right? So here we go. First of all, I want you to see, before we jump into the deception, I want you to see what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21, talking about the Jews. Now, he is having a discussion with the Jewish leadership here in Matthew chapter 21. I want you to notice in verse 23, who is he talking to? The priests, chief priests and elders. Chief priests and elders of the people confronted him, okay? So this is Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. This is who he's talking to, the leadership of the nation of Israel. Remember, they're under uh, the overall authority of the Roman Empire, but these are the leadership of the nation of Israel, okay? So he's having a discussion with them. And he tells them this parable. You know, a man owns a field. He, 
he uh, he rents the field out to these people and they grow grapes on it. They have a vineyard and uh, he's supposed to get some of the produce as payment, right? So he sends a servant, get some of the produce and they kill the servant. He finally sends his son and they kill the son. And so Jesus says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They pronounced their own doom. And they answered. That's the amazing thing about that, right? They said to Jesus, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their season. I can imagine Jesus kind of maybe getting a smile on his face and saying, you know, you're talking about yourself, right? <laughs> Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then he goes on to say this. This is the key verse. Matthew 21, 43. Listen to what Jesus says here. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, meaning the nation of Israel, and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. You see that? Because they rejected the Messiah, ultimately as a nation, they rejected the Messiah, right? Even past the cross, they had an opportunity to be able to fulfill their mission that God had given them, but they rejected the Messiah. And so he says, you're not going to be God's chosen people anymore. So ever since 34 AD, they haven't been God's chosen people. But that's not what you hear in popular churches today. Jeremy. He says, give it, uh, take it from you and give it to a nation. Did he have a particular nation? Yep. Like yep. Yeah, he sure did. Uh, uh, the kingdom of Christ. Mm. Right? And how do you be a part of that nation? By accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right? That's the nation that's going to bear the fruits of. And so notice, that's what happened. As a result of him saying this, you think uh, the Jewish leadership was happy? Mm, they suddenly got the picture of who he was speaking of. That's exactly right. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Mm -hmm. And so now we have this principle in the Bible that God's chosen people are the ones who have accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior, not the literal nation of Israel, right? True sons of Abraham. But because most denominations believe that Israel is still God's chosen people, they focus their eschatology or study of end time events <laughs> on literal pieces of land in the Middle East, brother. It started to be really problematic. We really started saying, all right, well, are we going to follow the genealogy of everybody back to Judah and make sure that all those people are actually Jewish? And that's a the majority of the people that live in Israel itself, Jews, may not even have that family lineage. So maybe we have a yeah, for some reason, there was a lot of Jews in Russia, and they wanted to be able to migrate to Israel. Did you notice that? Verse 43, that's, that's when Gentiles came ever now to see. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So we can look at some of those verses there. I want you to see uh, for yourself in the Bible there, because the Bible talks about these. Um, notice if we go to Galatians chapter 3. We'll also, we'll, we'll jump into Romans just a little bit, too. Galatians chapter 3. Let's see. Hope Mark didn't rip the chapter 3 out of the Bible. Yeah. Out of okay. Great chapter. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Greek, right? And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You see, now it's spiritual Israel, not literal Israel. You see that? And heirs according to the promise, right? Somebody have Romans chapter 9, verse 6. <coughs> It is not that the word of God is taking no effect, and they are not all Israel who are of, of it. They're not all Israel who are of Israel. What does he mean by that? It's the same line. It's the same thing you said. It's yeah. Spiritual context. It's, it's a spiritual moment. Exactly. 
And then verse eight goes on to say, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, the little descendants, these are not the children of God. You see that? It says the literal descendants of Abraham are not the children of God anymore. Right there in Romans 9 verse 8. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. You see, so your spiritual Israel, spiritual descendants, if you want to say of Abraham, uh, if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not literal Israel. So here's the problem. So now I'm going to be, uh, uh, let's see, do I have time to do this? I was going to be a minister of another denomination. <laughs> and I'm going to share with you what they say about this. No, first of all, I, tell you, I don't have time to do it. Um, let me give a little history to what we're going to do next time, okay? But here, here's the history behind it. So the reformers, they understood uh, that Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 was talking about how the devil was going to raise up a, uh, a church entity that looked like it was Christian, but really wasn't, okay? And so um, this, is what, this is what they did. The reformers said, okay, we're going to go back to the Bible, right? Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Knox, Wesley's, you know, all the modern churches that we have, the Protestant churches today. Okay, they said, we're going to get back to the Bible. And they were great men of God that directed people to Christ and back to the Bible. Okay? So they knew this. So what do you think the Catholic Church did when they saw all these people leaving the Catholic Church and losing their influence over the, not only over the people of Europe, but also the, 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 uh, the kings, the authority? We said, we got to do something. We got to do something. Yeah. We just can't sit around, Bill. We got we're, all these people, they're going to, oh my goodness, we're going to do something, right? And so, so this is what they came up with. They said, now these reformers are saying, and this is what Martin Luther wrote, that the papacy is the Antichrist, okay? The, the reformers believe that. That's the Antichrist. They said, you know, we, we got to come up with something to deflect that away from us. And so they did. They said... <clears throat> A man by the name of, he's a Jesuit priest, Francisco Rabira, right? He took this. Last week of this prophecy, and he moves it to the end of time. It says, when it says he, who, he will confirm a covenant, that's not the Messiah. That's talking about the Antichrist. And that doesn't happen now during the time of the Reformation, right? Which is the 16th century and the 17th century, right? It's sometime in the future. He's, so Francisco Rabira came up with this idea of taking the last seven years of this prophecy and sticking it at the end of time and calling it the seven-year tribulation. Okay? And that the Antichrist is going to appear in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. And guess how many Protestant churches bought into this? Oh. Zero. None of them. At the time. None of them, right. Remember, Francisco Rabira, he's uh, the late 1500s, early 1600s. He's in that range, right? Okay. We're, this, this is crazy. We're not going to buy into this. No Bible-believing Christian is going to believe what Francisco Rabira came up with, right? And so guess what? Did the reformers of these, the, the, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, did they buy into this in the 1700s? No. That's Catholic eschatology. We, we're not Catholic, right? Did they buy into it in the 1800s? No. No. Did you know that? Matter of fact, I went to these antiquarians, right? I've gone to Europe and done this. And looked at these old commentaries before 1850, pre-1850 commentaries. And I have not found a single Protestant church that believed this. Not a single one. So what happened was this. A man by the name of John Nelson Darby, he's called the father of dispensationalism. See, I'm running out of time. I know, I couldn't get through all this. He came up, he had these prophecy conferences in the 1830s. And this woman comes along, her name is Margaret uh, McDonald. 
I always got to be careful. Someone, I want to say Margaret Mitchell, but no, not going to win. <laughs> this is Margaret McDonald. She wrote a vision that she had of a secret coming of Jesus. So he took this idea of Francisco Ramirez moving the last week of this prophecy to the end of time and her vision of a secret coming of Jesus and put them together. And that's where you come up with the seven year tribulation and the secret rapture. Oh. Yeah. From John Nelson Darby. Guess who his student was? Ingersoll Schofield. And Ingersoll Schofield put these in the notes of the King James Version Bible, and it's called the Schofield Bible. You can buy Schofield Bible today. And that got propagated throughout Protestant churches. They started, they were reading the Bible, they're reading his notes, they're thinking, wow, this must be the truth. Okay. It still didn't stick. Okay. It still took some time. 1970s, Hal Lindsey writes a book, Late Great Planet Earth, right? That accelerates the reception by the Protestant churches of this Catholic eschatology. And then in the 1990s, Tim LaHaye comes up with the Left Behind series. And then they start making movies based on the Left Behind series, which is based on Hal Lindsey, which is based on John Nelson Darby, which is based on Francisco Rapido. And now you go and talk about eschatology or end time events with, with other churches. They talk about a seven year tribulation. They talk about a secret rapture, right? And a thousand years of peace on earth. Because Jesus is going to come back to this earth and establish, he's going to touch the Mount of Olives, right? That's what they say. Even though 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says he's not going to touch, right? So you see how the devil has now deceived most churches into believing a lie so one it takes your mind off of jesus and what he suffered for us takes you away from christ right and two comes up with a false theory about the second coming of jesus and the very scripture that is talking about he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week is talking about jesus confirming the covenant that he's going to suffer the second death and shed his blood so we can have our Sins cleansed. That's the covenant, right? You'll accept that. You'll cleanse your sins because he suffered the second death in your place. But instead, what are all the churches saying that means today? All oh, the Antichrist is going to have the covenant with the nation of Israel. The very scripture talking about Jesus, they apply now to the Antichrist. When Israel storms, they're trying really, really hard to build their temple. You know, when you talk to most Jews, talk to that live in the United, they don't want to see the temple rebuilt because guess what? Then they're going to have to take trips to Israel and sacrifice animals again. You think they want to do that? They don't want to do that, right? And guess what is on at the place where the temple mound was located, right? Second most, Second most holy place of the Muslim faith, right? So they, they had to be a major war to rebuild the temple. But the beautiful thing about this, right? I say beautiful in a way that, I mean, it's deceptive. The devil came up with an idea of deceiving people because you never get to it. It's always in the future. It's always in the future. It's always in the future. You could be right in the middle of everything happening, and you think you're looking to the future for this to happen. You see? Well, what a, if I, I mean, it's an ingenious deception, isn't it? You're always looking to the future instead of knowing what you're here now. Jeremy? And yeah, the fact that the mosque is there, and I think, you know, this is where the devil's real. You know, if the mosque wasn't there, then people would be thinking, oh, we can do this sooner, 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 because it's not there. And there's no hindrance for us to perform this, right? To rebuild. But the fact that it is there, you're always thinking, it's in the future. It's in the future. Right, exactly. Future, so. exactly. And you never get to it. And you never get to it. The second kind of can be happening, and they're still thinking it's in the future. <laughs> right, brother? All right. I think we run over our time. Okay. On, uh, Stephen's dad, I was looking up on um, Wikipedia. It somehow comes up with a birth date of AD 5 and a death date between AD 32 and 36. And then, um, Britannica says that the Catholic Church claims it as AD 36. And it's interesting to know that they celebrate his feast on the 26th, which is the day after they celebrate Christ's death, and that he is the father of 
like the stone masons. Oh, really? Stone masons. Yeah. Well, well, it's always best to follow what the Bible says there because you know the Catholic Church has made some things that just it doesn't harmonize right with the Bible. Extra deceptive part of that doctrine is it, it has a second chance. So yeah, you know, yeah. If you, if you have yeah. to notice all these people around you disappear, well, you got seven years to like figure it out. And, you know, your life. That's a great point. So let, every reason to like, let's get in. Let's cover why. The secret rapture is a truth in the Bible next time, okay? Let's do that. That's a great point. Um, when I see the church disappear, I'll get right with God. You know, that's, that's what you have to say. Father in heaven, we thank you for these wonderful truths in the Bible, this great prophecy. We just pray that you please continue to touch our hearts with your love, help us stay the word of God and share it with others. And we praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm a little familiar with what he's what he's written, and I know it's a huge impact on the Catholic Church, but I, I really haven't read this one. It looks like he was before. That's true. Yeah, I was thinking he was like the 12th, uh, 13th century, somewhere, somewhere there. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true.